Mancall with us today. I am Sarah Mancall. I'm the Policy Director for the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues. We are a membership association of scientists who study a range of psychological phenomena, and we host a congressional seminar series here on the Hill. And a few times a year, we try to bring experts from the psychological sciences to Capitol Hill to talk about really compelling areas of research that have implications for public policy. So today you're here for a briefing on the topic of ableism. Our speaker is Michelle R. Nario Redmond. She is a professor of psychology and a professor of biomedical humanities at Hiram College in Ohio. Dr. Nario Redmond specializes in stereotyping, prejudice, and disability studies. Her research focuses on group identification and political advocacy, strategies for coping with stigma, and the unintended consequences of simulating disability. She's passionate about social justice, universal design for learning, and increasing access to higher education. And she enjoys collaborating with students uh, on independent research. She created a school-based program on disability culture. And she just finished her first book, which Spissy published with Wiley. I have flyers out there at the table called Ableism, The Causes and Consequences of Disability Prejudice. And before I bring her on, I also want to give a huge thanks to Dr. Kim Stanton and the Office of James McGovern, who helped us arrange for today's briefing. And without further ado, our speaker, Dr. Nario Redmond. All right, thank you all. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you so much for coming. This is uh, really heartening, looking at my little clicker here. Um, I too want to thank the Office of um, Representative McGovern and Dr. Stanton for facilitating this event. Um, I appreciate your interest in this topic. It's a topic that affects us all. Ableism, which is the prejudice and discrimination that disables people from exercising their rights to participate as citizens, to vote, to parent children, to contribute, and to live quality lives. This first slide, uh, in addition to showing the title of the book, has a, an image on the bottom of a wheelchair facing a, a staircase, at the bottom of the staircase, and uh, the text says, well, actually it's not that first slide. <laughs> the text on this slide says, how to end the prejudice that no one talks about. Okay, so I wanna give you a sense of where I'm gonna go today. I appreciate that people are here because ableism is a difficult topic. It's an uncomfortable subject. And for the next hour, I will share with you what it looks like, who and what it impacts, and what solutions we've considered and still need to consider. I wrote this book to provoke difficult conversations by bringing together the latest social science research on the causes and the consequences of prejudice toward the largest minority group in the United States. Uh, so, according to the census, one in five people in this country has a disability. This would be typically thought of as a physical or mental condition that restricts participation in major life activities. It's one person in every three households. The CDC and some of the literature on this from the Center for American Progress now is documenting one in four people experience disability. This number, however, is an undercount because it does not include incarcerated individuals who make up over 40% of prisoners. So this image on the slide has a, a picture of a tree and I was looking for something that reflected this notion that we are family. And the tree indicates that you can think of disability as your sister, your brother, your son, daughter, grandmother. Most of us know people or are related to people that experience these conditions. Uh, and the other image on the slide shows the word disability, which I'd never seen before with the one in five um, representing the eye. We know that some people are born with conditions like Down syndrome, 
spina bifida, and yet the vast majority of impairments like cerebral palsy, brain and spinal cord injury, uh, and PTSD occur after birth. Ableism affects the able-bodied too. Uh, those with low vision, hearing loss, and depression, um, these are conditions that are common throughout the life cycle. Most of us here will experience disability, at least temporarily, especially as we age. It's more a question of when, not if. And it's this open enrollment nature of disability status that quite possibly is why ableism has been such a contentious topic. So this image shows a crossroads sign that has open enrollment on, on, on the sign. The concept of disability is highly contested and definitions differ across organizations that use different inclusion criteria. In national polls, the public doesn't even agree on what conditions should qualify as disabilities, particularly when it comes to mental health conditions, speech, and learning disabilities. This disconnect makes ableism ripe for investigation. So I wanna talk about the ABCs of ableism. There are many definitions out there, and similar to racism, saneism, and ageism, ableism is full of assumptions about whose lives are worth living and why certain bodies need to be controlled, protected, or improved. Ableism is also distinct from other prejudices as well, uh, similar to transgender and sexual minorities, people with disabilities are often the only person, although not completely, but often, in the family um, that experiences a disability. And that means that they're not as connected to community of other disabled role models who can sh pave the way for how to cope and how to claim disability status in a positive way. Um, that leaves them at risk for internalizing that disability is a tragic defect that must be cured, overcome, or otherwise eliminated. So for social psychologists like myself, ableism has attitudinal or emotional, cognitive, and behavioral elements. It operates at multiple levels, and it affects our perceptions of ourselves, our interactions with others, and the policies and practices that exclude an entire group of people the largest minority demographic uh, minority group in this country. It wasn't until we started studying disability as a social category, a minority group membership, that we could even begin to uncover the broader implications of ableism on society. And that's been pretty recent, at least in my field. Traditional approaches have focused almost exclusively on what was wrong with individual bodies and minds. Yet these explanations fail to explain persistent inequalities and the mechanisms, myths, beliefs, and so forth that have been used to justify a range of dehumanizing outcomes. So this next slide shows um, an image of an iceberg. And we psychologists like this metaphor because it illustrates how much of what we think about lies below the surface, an iceberg has most of its mass underneath the water. And the tip of the iceberg often represents what we have access to, what we can think about, and what we can change more readily. Um, but the way I plan to approach this talk, the way I approach the book, is to begin reviewing what I describe as the more distant or distal uh, sources of ableism, and then I'll move on to um, what we tend to learn uh, what we've learned, I should say, over the decades of research on what works and what doesn't work when it comes to reducing prejudice and promoting civil rights. So, starting with, let me see if I can get my clicker to work, there we go. Starting with the evolutionary origins of ableism, this image shows a progression of figures, starting with a chimp and progressing to a hunched over hominid, uh, an upright human, and ending with the international wheelchair symbol, as if to hearken to this notion that evolution um, isn't always about, uh, well, you'll see. Usually people can't catch disability like they catch the flu. 
But around the world, disabled people are often treated as if they are contagious. They're shunned, isolated, and they can provoke repulsion. Why does this happen to people who pose no risk of infecting others? Evolutionary psychology has a lot to say about why prejudice may have helped us survive in ways that still show up today. The argument is that those early hominids who were better at avoiding dangers would be more likely to survive into adulthood and pass on their more wary and vigilant predispositions to their offspring, who would then be also more wary and vigilant of potential dangers. Dangers like strangers, uh, poisons in food, and other contaminants. Our ancestors would have needed a way to detect potential uh, dangerous pathogens, and so you might ask what kind of clues are there that signal contamination and disease? Things like open sores, swollen glands, spasms, fatigued postures. These actually are the symptoms that characterize some of the world's deadliest infections. Today we have vaccines, but back in the day, being wary of things that seemed contaminated might have been protective. Unfortunately, clues to disease are not always observable, and neither are they accurate. This may have led to a disease avoidance system, according to this account, uh, that was too inclusive, that was oversensitive, so our ancestors may have responded fearfully to a lot of people who looked and acted physically unusual. Could we have evolved a fear of contagion toward anything that remotely resembled disease, even people with conditions that weren't infectious? These images on this slide show people with cancer left palates, burns, birthmarks, um, and in the next slide, uh, uneven limbs, who have all been treated as if they were contagious. And they were responded to, or they have been and can be responded to, with gestures of disgust, like this young boy is in the middle of the slide who's sticking out his tongue. Even those who limp and have uneven eyes or asymmetrical limbs may have all triggered a false alarm because presumably it's better to err on the side of caution than to get too close to others who may be sick and dying. Our research shows that many disabled people have been told by others that they fear catching their disability. So I included a quote from our 2015 survey of a, a woman with a sensory impairment who says, students didn't want to sit by me they asked to be moved out of my class because they thought they could catch blindness. I hated this time of my life. I cried every day and I wish I was dead. Consistent with an evolutionary account, the evidence shows that whether on trains, near planes, or even on the street in field studies, there are persistent patterns of distancing from people with permanent and temporary disabilities. Cross-culturally, people with disabilities are excluded from communal events, they're made to sleep apart, and are cast away, even disinherited. The Disability History Museum, shown on this slide, is full of examples of institutionalized avoidance, where disabled people have been barred from restaurants, churches, and other public places. During the Holocaust, they too were called parasitic vermin. People even express disgust and avoid objects thought to be contaminated simply because of the person who touched them. So not only do people refuse to shake hands with those who are said to have cancer, they also avoid using their kitchen utensils. Some are unwilling to wear the clothing if previously worn by people with traumatic brain injuries and won't swim in the same pool with those labeled mentally ill. In 2013, Justin Park and his colleagues found that people with, from various ethnic groups in the US reported extreme discomfort about touching those with skin rashes and HIV, but were similarly uncomfortable about touching those with amputated limbs and birthmarks. 
Now, the universality of contagion fears is not yet well established. In animal studies, some primates refuse to groom those with paralyzed legs, but others, born blind or with weak legs, get extra care from the entire troop. Clearly, beauty standards and appearance standards vary widely across the world, and we definitely learn prejudice. In fact, distancing behavior is much more common during initial encounters, first meetings with people who have visible disabilities. But those who regularly encounter friends and family members with disabilities do not distance themselves and are less germophobic in general. The impact of our experience, our experience with people with diverse minds and bodies cannot be underestimated. So even if some discomfort with unusual bodies is driven by an impulse to avoid contamination, these inclinations can be disrupted with experience. The image on this slide just shows uh, a, an adult chimp with a baby chimp on his back or her back. Moving on to some of the existential sources of prejudice, we can talk about the universal need of, that, uh, that we have for protection that goes beyond our drive for physical safety to include psychological needs for belonging, for purpose, and for self-worth. Some of the earliest ideas about the origins of disability prejudice focus on how disability reminds us of our body's vulnerability to damage and decline. Several scholars throughout the years have proposed that disabled people are therefore avoided because they remind us of our mortality. <coughs> and we don't want to be reminded. So instead, people deploy prejudice as a way to escape awareness of our own frailty, deny our limitations, and the notion that disability is a fate that will most likely happen to us all. This image shows a graveyard with cross tombstones and a headless horseman. According to these existential prejudice accounts, ableism is one way to reduce anxiety about our impermanence. Disability serves as an unwanted reminder that life is not predictable, that people exist outside of the boundaries of what many consider a quality, purposeful life. And in response to these unwanted reminders, disabled people are not only ignored and excluded, but can be the targets of violent contempt and abuse. The text here reads, disability can be threatening on a number of existential grounds. Disabled people can remind us of our potential for deterioration, but also disabled people tend to violate several cultural values, especially those that we uh, harbor in the West, about the value of human superiority over animals, about the value of freedom, independence, and the importance of productivity. Disability reminds us that strength, intellect, and language uh, are neither guaranteed nor permanent. Humans are not so unique from other animals. We all break, we all have accidents that can result in traumatic injury. And not only can disability threaten beliefs about who we think we are and what we deserve, uh, when people are asked to imagine in experimental studies what is disability like, they assume the worst, that disabled people's lives are tragic and long-suffering. It's very hard for people to imagine themselves bouncing back from disability. So even though we know that people adapt, that people um, get used to their circumstances, no matter what those circumstances are, we're terrible predictors of our own ability to make change and to adapt. So to keep thoughts of death out of our minds, people keep themselves busy. They go to work, they get married, they become parents, and through our social roles, we transform ourselves from mere mortals that breathe, eat, poop, and procreate into superior souls with the capacity for immortality. People who live up to societal standards of value, the beautiful, the intelligent, and productive, get recognition and rewards while those who deviate from these values are ostracized, incarcerated, or worse. And although these ideas have been hard to test, 
they have been tested empirically for over 30 years in over 25 countries. We now have experimental evidence that shows that when you make death salient, when you have people think about what it's like to die, people are more likely to condemn, ridicule, and punish those who violate the values that they cherish the most. Specifically, when people are asked to write about what it feels like to die, they express more prejudice toward Jews, Muslims, and disabled people compared to those who write about other aversive events. Galad Hirschberger finds that disabled people are judged more negatively, are helped less, and in some cases are offered less compassion from people who are made aware of their own mortality. Studies also find that people generate more death-related thoughts after reading about a permanently paralyzed person compared to someone who just broke their leg. Some of the more interesting studies that test these ideas uh, about whether prejudice um, derives from existential concerns um, focus on the need to feel distinct from other animals. So this slide shows a human palm that's face up holding the paw of a brown dog and says, we are all animals. We are not alone in our belief uh, with other cultures that, that man is superior to other animals. And these beliefs can go a long way in protecting people from feeling vulnerable about their place in the universe. We work very hard as humans to keep reminders of our animal natures at bay. We cover up our blemishes, we perfume body odors, and we make private and sanitary the elimination of waste. Enter people with disabilities. Some who drool and are incontinent, may crawl on the floor, shake, or squeal. Our bodies deteriorate and die. So thoughts of death have been shown to lead people to express more disgust over bodily fluids like mucus and blood. And disgust reactions actually inhibit the brain's ability to perceive others' humanity. I want to say that again because I just find it to be so compelling. Disgust reactions, which are not only in response to bodily fluids, inhibit our ability to perceive others' humanity. So when people are confronted with hints of menstruation or urine on a wheelchair cushion, it becomes hard to deny that we are all creatures. And perhaps this helps explain, in part, while several, several US cities passed ugly laws that prohibited disabled people from entering restaurants and other public spaces. Today, some people eat with assistive devices or may have attendants that wipe their mouths in feeding tubes, which seems so uncivilized to some people. And what happens to people, disabled people, who fail to control their bodily imp impulses? Caregivers will often punish those who soil the bed. And sex is highly regulated, especially in, in institutions. Perhaps this is why marital and birth control regulations were so easily imposed on those whose human status continues to be questioned. This slide shows an image of, um, is titled Ableism Ugly Laws, and shows an image of an elderly man and his dog outside of a gated community um, with the text that reads, some US cities once banned disease and deformed people from public places. Not everybody knows about this. Today's, uh, let's move on to this slide. <coughs> there are implications for this work with respect to dehumanizing treatments. People with disabilities, historically, have been cast in less than human terms. They're denied personhood and have a history of dehumanizing treatments. These treatments have been used to justify their neglect and exploitation. A growing body of research shows that viewing humans as superior to animals is a strong predictor of a variety of intergroup <coughs> prejudices. Some disabled people are denied traits that are considered essentially human, like emotional responsiveness and warmth. And at other times, disabled people are denied traits that distinguish them from animals, like civility and morality. Studies that have compared perceptions about from 24 or about 24 different minority <coughs> groups, 
uh, found that disa the disabled and mentally ill ranked lowest in being perceived to per possess rationality, refinement, and self-restraint, which are traits considered essentially human or uniquely human. This may be why so many cases of violence against disabled people refer to them as bestial, immoral creatures. This slide shows a chimp uh, playing chess with a, a, an adult white male, um, <coughs> signaling that maybe chimps are uh, just as smart, if not smarter than some of us. Philosophers still agree that whether, uh, I should say, philosophers still disagree over whether people with severe intellectual disabilities even qualify as persons. And this rhetoric has been used to justify subhuman treatment. In several residential facilities throughout the 21st century, residents have been documented as being starved or fed bird-like while lying down, were left to stew in their own wastes, or were denied heat in the winter on the presumption that they couldn't feel cold, denied pain medication on the presumption that they couldn't feel pain because they were less than human. Mark Sherry is an academic who studies disability hate crime, and he documents the pervasiveness of these crimes in the United States, where perpetrators deliberately target people because of their disabilities in order to humiliate and attack them. The US Bureau of Justice notes that disabled people are one and a half times more likely to be victimized by violent crimes than non-disabled people. And they're more than twice as likely to be raped and sexually assaulted. Between 1997 and 2007, rape was over 30 times more likely to occur in disability hate crimes compared to other hate crimes. Hate incidents are on the rise since the election of our current president, who has also called for the expanding of involuntary commitments to those with mental health conditions. In one Ohio suburb, not too far from where I live, an autistic boy uh, who wanted to participate in the ice bucket challenge had urine and feces dumped on him by so-called friends. This crime was prosecuted as a hate crime, although many escape prosecution because they're rarely reported in the media. And some states don't even have hate crime legislation, which makes reporting difficult. Other states, the reporting is voluntary. So this slide about hate crimes uh, identifies that disability hate crimes are more common uh, than it, when the perpetrator knows the victim. Uh, but police are even more likely to dismiss those cases when there is a pre-existing relationship. And some of the documented incidents of disability hate crimes include being beaten with one's own assistive device, like a crutch, being dumped out of wheelchairs, being set on fire, being made to eat feces, being over-medicated, sexually assaulted, raped, and murdered. Most forms of victimization, sexual violence, even medical ex experimentation are accompanied by belief systems, by ideologies about why certain people deserve certain treatments. Even today, the removal of life-sustaining food and breathing tubes can be justified as mercy killing as long as disabled people are first characterized as suffering or burdens. Those labeled as a danger to themselves or others are still forcibly medicated and committed to institutions in the name of protection. And an entire tragic persons industry exists for those with special needs. Ideologies can be used to legitimize ableist practices by offering handy explanations for why some people should be treated differently than others. So I'll talk about some of these ideologies next, including um, American eugenics and social Darwinism, meritocratic or just world beliefs, and the biomedical model of disability. Although largely discredited, eugenic ideologies have influenced many policies that are still around today related to the control of immigrants, disabled, and other minority groups. These beliefs were articulated in the US and in the UK long before World War II. 
when 240,000 disabled children and adults were rounded up by doctors and nurses to be starved, gassed, and exterminated. Yet few students are aware that these atrocities occurred. Number one, because we don't include them in the history books, and number two, because these were not prosecuted as war crimes. They were considered mercy killings intended to free families from a lifetime of sacrifice. The image that you're looking at is the memorial to the victims of the National Socialist Euthanasia Killings. It stands in front of the Berlin Philharmonic, and it is a image of a 20 foot meter long, 80 foot tall blue glass monument that here we see people laying uh, wreaths in front of. So I was born in 1964, I'm the last of the baby boomers. Um, by then, in 64, over 65,000 disabled Americans had been forcibly sterilized. Since 2002, several governors of states have issued formal apologies for violating people's right to bear children. Today, the right to marry still remains restricted for disabled people in over 30 states, and the right to parent is not guaranteed either. Disability status is still grounds for the legal termination of parenting rights. Children can be removed on the basis of parents' IQ, even though IQ is not predictive of parental competency or capacity with supports. The legacy of American eugenics can still be found in the mission statements of segregated placements that have stunted uh, the development of people and led to some maladaptive behaviors as well. Critics argue that special, special education itself can be a one-way road to prison where kids learn to submit to a curriculum of control instead of achievement. Now these are controversial issues and complex, but I note them here because they represent a new wave of eugenic practices selectively applied to disability and people with disabilities. Medical personnel routinely to this day, still advise parents to abort in the case of disability, deafness, or even conditions that may not develop until later in life, like Alzheimer's. And it's the deselection of only certain types of embryos that's problematic. So this slide shows um, a couple of things. My colleague, Dr. Olette Coble temple um, has worked to uh, leverage parental rights including disability equality under the banner of pride. And uh, there's a map here that just shows that 35 states still restrict dis uh, disabled people from marriage and parenting. Practices like these are often justified based on the assumption that disabled people's quality of life is not worth living at all. And similar justifications have been used to support physician-assisted suicide in the case of disability. This has prompted congressional testimony from activists like Diane Coleman from ADAPT and others from Not Dead Yet, an organization that represents those with spinal cord injuries uh, whose banner is Assist Us to Live, Not Die. There's a cartoon image here that shows how this plays out. There's a woman uh, pictured in a wheelchair, a power wheelchair, at. Uh, the crossroads between a staircase where the sign reads suicide prevention programs and a ramp that reads assisted suicide. The image on this slide shows a gate with a padlock and reflects the dehumanizing actions that seek to tame and restrain and incarcerate disabled students which have been well documented even in school settings where restraints and seclusion are justified in the name of protection from self-harm. Now often these schools um, have policies that parents do not know about and are critically not including those who are uh, restrained in, in the decision making. Ideologies also work together in ways that maintain the way things are, the status quo. For example, some more strongly endorse the meritocratic belief that anyone can get ahead on their own merits, or that success comes only to those who work hard, or that 
do things by themselves without assistance, who are considered more deserving than those who live interdependent lives. It's this view, or in this view, the only reason that people fail to overcome depression, addiction, stuttering, or dyslexia is because they didn't do enough personally. The danger of this kind of meritocratic thinking is that success is attributed to individual efforts without recognizing how privilege plays a role or how legal remedies like the ADA were necessary to increase access in the first place. Another well-researched area focuses on beliefs in a just world, where people get what they deserve and deserve what they get. So for example, people are less willing to support services for those they believe to be responsible for the onset of their disabilities. And they're more supportive of medical solutions for treatments considered to be reversible. So this has implications for disabled people who fear they may be pressured to seek corrective surgeries. Uh, for example, if a low vision driver doesn't wear their glasses, they're held liable for accidents. And some deaf people have written that they worry that they won't be eligible for sign language interpretation uh, once deafness can be cured with sophisticated hearing aids. This slide just shows um, an image of a, a shadow man climbing um, steep blocks uh, with the text that says merit equals IQ plus effort. There are several clashing ideologies about the origins of disability as well. Where does it come from? Was it an act of God? Did the parents do something wrong? The predominant view of the origins of disability is that it's located inside the heads or the bodies of people described as defective, malformed, and abnormal. But with pathology as the starting point for making sense of disability, medical explanations promote the use of medical tools to prevent, fix, and cure the problem or what's broken. Disabled people are expected to be good patients, even if that means enduring invasive therapies and painful prosthetics in order to normalize their appearance. People who view disability exclusively as a condition of the body assume that the kid in the wheelchair isn't playing on the playground because her legs are paralyzed. But they fail to consider that perhaps the bark chips on the ground are what prevent her from accessing the swings. So I included an image of a barrier-free playground that shows you don't have to have bark chips. You can use other surfaces that are safe for kids to fall on and can include different kinds of uh, equipment and swings. Biomedical explanations equate disability as the same thing as impairment. They seek to fit disabled people into the existing environment. And this explanation stands in very sharp contrast to the recognition that disability is a social phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that's imposed on top of any impairments that people may have. Being disabled by society refers to the architectural, educational, and economic restrictions that are neither natural nor inevitable. Human decisions create laws that inform the location and width of building entrances. Human decisions determine the presence or absence of ramps, elevators, signage, and the spacing of public and private arenas. And human decisions are responsible for the layout of college campuses and the content of the curriculum. But when we design for a narrower range of human variation that actually exists in the population, many people are systematically excluded, whether disabled or not. According to a socio-political explanation of the origins of disability, disabled people are a disadvantaged minority group, a group that's come together to share their common experiences with misrepresentation and exclusion. In study after study, the most persistent difficulties disabled people face, according to themselves, are those not associated with their biological conditions, but come directly from damaging policies and practices that fail to include them as equal citizens. This understanding of disability as a social creation has both politicized 
and empowered people with a sense of identification to a much broader disability community. And research shows that those who endorse these ideas that disability is a social political creation are much more likely to recognize discrimination as the ultimate factor of determining who is disabled by society and who is not. All of the explanatory models, and there are many of them, are incomplete, and some work to legitimize inequality while others promote the drive for social change. The beliefs that we have, the ideologies we've been talking about are communicated. That's how they're perpetuated. They're spread through everyday conversations, through jokes, and through the stories that people tell. The language that we use to describe disability can also be actively deployed to sway public opinion. So language influences not only what people think, but what they fail to consider as well. So when ramps and captions and interpreters are framed as special needs, people don't tend to think of them as civil rights. <clears throat> it wasn't until disabled people started describing their problems in terms of discrimination that disability rights activism even became possible. Metaphors about people with disabilities are deeply ingrained in everyday language. People use the word blind to intimate ignorance. Politicians in their last year of office are called lame ducks. And to experience terror is to be crippled or paralyzed by fear. It's simply overhearing people use derogatory slurs leads them to devalue those targeted. There is, however, a new language, or new language evolves, and um, new terms are introduced that disrupt dominant discourses with more contemporary views. 10 years after the passage of the ADA, Beth Haller's work shows that the term handicapped uh, decreased in both the Washington Post's reporting and the New York Times, while the term people with disabilities increased. Yet both newspapers increased their use following the passage of the ADA of the terms wheelchair bound or confined to wheelchairs. This is in spite of there being journalistic guidelines in place that advise against characterizing wheelchair users as uh, passive and imprisoned by their equipments instead of being liberated by them or by this equipment. Unwanted forms of helping can also result from repeatedly hearing that people are confined to their wheelchairs instead of, again, having these equipment uh, opportunities give them more access. Among the most popular news stories uh, today, still, are those that spotlight disabled people who have worked to overcome their limitations. They describe disabled people as inspiring because they achieve success against all odds or at least what people expected them. So the tendency to admire those perceived to have overcome their disabilities by daring to appear in public, by going to college, dating, or playing a sport, have evolved into a more modern form of ableism known as inspiration porn. This slide has memes that portray disabled people as extraordinary objects of courage so for example, there's a young woman who's about three years old, maybe four with Down syndrome, and the caption reads, the only disability in life is a bad attitude. The uh, maybe five, six-year-old boy in the middle is pictured running in a track race with titanium blades instead of legs, and his caption reads, your excuse is invalid. And finally, the last panel shows um, a young African-American couple a uh, young girl in a wheelchair, a power wheelchair, and her date standing up in a suit, and the, the meme reads, he asked her to the prom even in her condition. Like and share equals respect. Inspiration porn has been defined as an exploitive practice that uses images of disabled people during every, doing everyday tasks, shopping, going to class, in order to motivate others or shame other disabilities, perhaps, for not doing the same. The problem with benevolent ableism 
is not that disabled people are never deserving of admiration or respect, but when ordinary activities are portrayed as heroic, disabled people describe feeling objectified. And the subtler message is that if all it takes is a positive attitude, anyone can overcome their disability if they really wanted to. So if they're not, perhaps they're not trying hard enough. Rarely do we see human interest stories at the end of the evening news about creatively, uh, how disabled people creatively navigate the architectural policy and attitudinal barriers they confront. Well-intentioned kindness often reflects a misunderstanding that what disabled people really want is admiration, special treatment, and protection instead of human recognition and equal rights. There's also a paradox where employers consistently express a positivity bias toward workers with disabilities, but they're less supportive about hiring them. Yet research consistently shows that once hired, employees with disabilities are considered more reliable and have better attendance records than non-disabled employees on average. In a national poll on corporate social justice from 2016, more than 80% of consumers said they preferred to do businesses with companies that hire people with disabilities. And this slide comes from um, an organization called gatepath.org, and it just summarizes some of the statistics associated with successful employment outcomes. Like 85% of employees with disabilities retain even in high turnover jobs. So we're entering what some social psychologists like Chris Crandall call a new normative window, where popular discourse is shifting between what was previously considered acceptable and what is increasingly recognized as prejudicial or ableist. So for example, many disability activists and scholars call themselves disabled people, privileging disability identity first. This is not universal, people also sometimes prefer people with disabilities, and it should be um, the purview of the person as to how they identify. But there's even a hashtag now, um, thanks to Lawrence Carter Long, that's uh, disabled, hashtag, say the word, because so many people are afraid to use it. My own work on the predictive power of claiming disability identity demonstrates that the more disabled people self-define as a member of the disability community, the more they affiliate with other disabled people, the more they advocate for social change, and the more they get involved politically. The more people identify as disabled people, the higher their well-being and their sense of pride and belonging to a culture that includes many famous um, historical figures that they may not have learned about in school. So I want to move to talking briefly about another area of work that I've done regarding um, the cultural stereotypes that we have of disabled people. And this slide just shows a, an image of a very sleek wheelchair. <laughs> we know that belief systems are only effective to the extent that they're shared, that they're consensual. Before 2010, cultural stereotypes about deafness and spinal cord injury I'm sorry, cultural stereotypes about disabled people as a whole were considered unlikely because impairments like blindness and deafness were so very different. But empirical evidence is corroborating what disabled people have said for a very long time, that regardless of their impairment, they are stereotyped in pervasive and consistent ways. Stereotypes are specific beliefs that go beyond what we observe and can predict how others are likely to behave. They're learned from the stories that we read and the shows that we watch on TV and other socialization practices. Even cartoons tell a story about disabled people as a group, although some of these are certainly changing. These are Disney characters that portray disabled people as tragic victims, like the Hunchback of Notre Dame, angry villains, like Captain Hook, or incompetent dupes, like Mr. Magoo and Dopey from Snow White. Stereotypes are also more likely to develop when groups are found disproportionately in certain roles. So throughout history, disabled people have occupied the sick role and the unemployed beggar 
while being excluded from the role of parent, partner, and executive. Disabled people are also less likely to marry and increasingly more likely to divorce. People shouldn't have to choose between staying married and keeping their Medicaid, and yet that is what has been happening of late. In 2010, some students of mine in, um, at Hiram College and at Reed College worked on quantifying the cultural stereotypes of disabled men and women. And we discovered that both men and women um, identified as disabled people were stereotyped as dependent, incompetent, and asexual. Those were the top three things that people linked to this stereotype of, of the group. Disabled men were also more likely to be thought of as angry, and disabled women were more likely to be considered unfit parents. People actually said that, that disabled women were stereotyped as not capable of nurturing or being mothers. This may be why that we see um, people react with surprise when they encounter women with disabilities who actually are parents, thinking that they're the nanny instead. One policy implication is that if people fail to consider disabled people as parents, then putting baby changing tables in um, accessible bathrooms might not be on the radar. And if doctors don't expect disabled patients to be sexual beings, they're much less likely to actually test for pregnancies and sexually transmitted diseases, which has also been found. But stereotypes change. They do change over time and with changing social circumstances. So for example, warmth is a trait that's usually reserved for groups considered stereotypically compliant, like society's legitimate dependents, uh, elderly people and children. But when disabled people are framed as competing for resources, they may instead be stereotyped as cold and manipulative. And these kinds of stereotypes can elicit contempt for people perceived to be freeloading at the expense of others. According to Susan Fisk, immigrants, homeless people, and those who receive public assistance can also incite feelings of disgust, which are then used to justify their containment. <coughs> it's important to remember that disgust is not only aroused um, by those viewed as uh, having abnormal bodies, but is also aroused by those who are viewed as leeching resources intended for those considered more deserving. In internment camps, the, 19, the 2016 massacre of disabled people in Japan are both examples of contemptuous prejudice. Ableist beliefs and attitudes are important because they impact judgments, employment practices, and biased eligibility decisions that affect healthcare, particularly for disabled people of color, who are much less, more likely to be diagnosed with behavioral problems and psychoses and forced into treatment um, involuntarily. Some of the earliest pioneers of disability research uh, about prejudice in particular recognized that attitudes toward disabled people were not just positive or benevolent, nor were they just negative and hostile. They're much more likely to be mixed or ambivalent. So, for example, if disabled people act grateful and submissive, they're seen as more deserving of charitable treatment. People are also much more likely to feel sorry for and want to help disabled people who appear to be suffering. But as soon as they violate expectations, talk back, file a complaint, they actually may provoke anger. Sometimes disabled people are even rewarded for subordination with more services and benefits provided that they agree not to marry or make more than a few thousand dollars a month or are willing to move into a nursing home. But job opportunities should not be competing against income support programs that create these disincentives to working for those that want to work. People will not seek employment if having a job means losing their independent living or eligibility for life-sustaining supports. Able-bodied workers have disabilities and chronic illnesses too. Pity uh, is typically reserved for low-status cooperative groups, groups that are stereotyped as warm, like women, children, again, and the elderly. 
but instead of genuine compassion, pity instigates fatherly behaviors that infantilize, overprotect, and take control over people's lives. Studies show that people use higher pitched voices when speaking to adults that they thought were disabled professionals compared to adults who were professionals without disabilities. And people with disabilities consistently report being the targets of inappropriate assistance, assistance for which they are expected to be grateful. Pity is also directly linked to active volunteering and charitable donations. No one, however, wants to hire someone or befriend someone that they pity. It leads to the chronic mistaking of disability identities as tragic and suffering instead of satisfying and worthwhile. Pity is not the reaction that disabled people who are thought to be competing for resources or parking spaces uh, receive. So a second form of ambivalent ableism reflects a combination of begrudging admiration, resentment, and bitterness toward those perceived to be occupying positions of increasing power. Recent studies show that disabled people have been the targets of jealous envy, reserved for groups that are typically stereotyped as competent, but cold. So as disabled people become more visible in public, advancing their civil rights, ableism in the form of backlash against disability rights protections has resulted. Recent headlines, for example, depict disabled people as manipulative scammers for filing lawsuits against businesses that have failed to comply with the ADA for sometimes close to 30 years. As a consequence, many disabled people, particularly those with less visible and more fluid conditions, still struggle to qualify for accommodations. Accusations of fakery um, or fraud are also common among those who fail to understand how a physically disabled person may sometimes get up from their assistive device or walk short distances. It's not a miracle. It's just that some disabled people use assistive technologies for some things and not others. People who accuse disabled people of fraud have no idea how difficult it can be to qualify for disability services, not to mention the waiting lists. This image that contrasts pity with envy shows an, uh, a man in a suit bending down in a condescending way to a woman in a wheelchair and I, I just found this other image of a parking space designated with the international wheelchair symbol but that's surrounded by a curb so no one can really get in. And the sign says, I'm not jealous of handicapped parking that much. So what do we know about what works to reduce prejudice? Most studies have focused on ways of increasing contact with those with and without disabilities. And we now have considerable evidence that intergroup contact can be quite effective if, and this is the big if, if groups are cooperating and have equal status in an organization that is supportive of equality. When it comes to creating the optimal conditions for intergroup contact, disabled people have had to fight for access just to be able to make contact in the first place. Other approaches to prejudice reduction include confronting prejudice when you see it, asking why did you say that, or did you know that you're being ableist, or even what do you mean by that? We can change the norms of what people think about by responding proactively. Um, we also know that disability as a form of diversity and as part of the multicultural education is gaining traction. But unfortunately, one of the most popular interventions designed to reduce prejudice and raise awareness has to do with simulating the disability experience. For example, um, my work and the work of my colleague Arielle Silverman, who is here today, has been all about finding out empirically, do these techniques work? Do they make people more understanding? Do they reduce ableism? And what we've discovered, in general, is people love to participate in these activities where they're blindfolded for a day, uh, where they wear earplugs to simulate deafness, or roll around in a wheelchair and are told, this is what it's like. 
they end up leaving these activities with the impression that they get it, which they very well may not. Um, so when we put this to the empirical test, we found in our studies that disability simulation programs consistently fail to reduce prejudice and can actually make people feel helpless, confused, anxious, and even more vulnerable to becoming disabled themselves. Multiple scholars have called for their cessation. This image shows um, intergroup contact, a woman in a wheelchair working alongside uh, able-bodied peers who may or may not have invisible disabilities, and an example of disability simulation uh, is a couple people being blindfolded, feeling their way around a room. Most prejudice reduction programs, unfortunately, at least yet, have been in the service of challenging intergroup inequalities. Instead, they focus on promoting liking and friendship or tolerance, assuming that once attitudes change, people will stop discriminating and open the doors to passive disadvantaged disabled people. The most enduring positive impacts on ableist practices have been policy-based, including structural changes for inclusive integration, access to the built environment, and anti-discrimination legislation. But laws, even the good laws that we have on the books, are not always enforced or monitored for compliance, and complaints can go uninvestigated. Next year, the ADA turns 30 years old, and compliance is still a huge issue. President Obama, in 2015, on the anniversary of the ADA that year, said, we have got to do better. Our country cannot let all of that incredible talent go to waste, 20% of the population. We know that policy change is much more likely when collective actions operate through public opinion. Like two years ago, when disabled people put their bodies on the line and made national news for getting arrested after occupying congressional buildings like this one to repeal um, or to block the repeal of the Affordable Care Act. So some of the images on this slide show some of those protests. They staged die-ins. One says, health care is a human right. And the other says, please don't take away my health care. And I also want to draw your attention to an article that just came out this year from the Center for American Progress, which has some amazing writers working on disability policy issues. Um, this is a, a good news thing because it seems like we're getting more traction among politicians running for president this year. And um, I would look up, if you can, the 10 disability policy questions every president should be able to answer. We need more enforcement of existing civil rights legislation. We need more interdependent approaches to work and school with partnered, supportive um, mentorships and other interdependent opportunities for people. More effective transitioning from high school to fair pay community living and internships. We need more um, accommodations for college students with and without disabilities. Many of these advancements that now benefit the broader population from texting to captions um, now benefit many people with or without disabilities, but they were fought for by those who were members of the independent living, psychiatric survivors, and disability rights movements. What's key to consider is the extent to which disability advocacy is for disabled people, with disabled people, and or by disabled people who are the experts when it comes to representing their concerns. Contributions of disabled people may be voluntary, paid, or again, through interdependent networks. There's no one right way. So I wanna take just a minute to talk about some of the legislative initiatives that have been identified by colleagues to keep on your radar. I, I think many of you are working on some of these issues right now. The Disability Integration Act is about the right of disabled people to have personal care services in their homes. Um, it's far more cost effective than being condemned to a nursing home. This act is about shifting long-term care funding from institutional placements and prohibiting insurance companies from denying disabled people the right to live in their own communities. 
We also need to think about investing in domestic workers who support disabled people as personal care attendants and otherwise, who need training and health care benefits themselves to support us baby boomers who will need them. There's an act called For the People Act. Um, according to Rutgers, eligible voters with disabilities have increased faster than those without. So in terms of households with disabled members, that's one quarter of the electorate increasing our rates faster than those without disabilities. There's a potential to harness that voting power. So this particular act um, that Senator Tom Udall and Jeff Merkley introduced <laughs> includes provisions to address barriers that disabled people face uh, in, in getting to the voting booths, which are inaccessible in 60 to 80 percent of the spaces. People need more places to register to vote besides motor vehicle locations because many do not drive. And training of poll, poll workers, voting machines that are accessible to assistive technology tools. These provisions should also help low income and non-disabled parents get out to vote as well. There's the marriage access for people with special abilities bill, which is about making sure that uh, income, resources, assets are counted toward SSI eligibility instead of toward household income so people don't lose Medicaid. This bill needs to be expanded beyond those that have developmental and intellectual disabilities. There's the Inclusive Home Design Act uh, introduced by Representative Jan Schakowsky, which is all about making sure that more than 5% of new single family homes get, that get federal funds like HUD and FHA are built so that disabled people can live in them and have friends come to visit. This, help though, this, this will help those who develop disabilities later in life avoid being displaced or face high renovation costs. It ensures that there's just one entrance at least without any steps that there is a bathroom on the first floor and wide enough doorways for people to get through. These are low cost solutions. The Disability Access Credit Expansion Act introduced by Senator Tammy Duckworth doubles the tax credit for small businesses to renovate for improved accessibility. And we all can do more when it comes to frequenting and supporting businesses that have made changes and perhaps boycotting those that refuse. So in conclusion, ableism is not limited to prejudice against traditional impairment groups. People are now living with environmentally induced chronic illnesses, chemical sensitivities, and also bionic limbs and implants and supplements that enhance their abilities beyond species typicality. In order to identify which solutions work, when, and for whom, much more work is needed that incorporates disabled people as expert knowers. From an early age, students need to be educated about how ableism operates. <clears throat> it's my sincere hope that this volume, in addition to all the great work many of you in this room are doing, will stimulate many new conversations and reforms. The term ableism itself helps clarify the idea that anyone can be impacted by ability-related discrimination. For example, people without a diagnosed condition or any documented activity restriction can still be denied rights on the basis of their physical, cognitive, or sensory abilities. And these abilities are fluid. They change with the context and over the life course. We know disability is part of our multicultural landscape. It's a group of people that, uh, that constitutes 57 uh, million Americans, more if you count those <coughs> incarcerated. And many of us will belong, do belong, or will join the group uh, soon. We need to think about disability as a major aspect of diversity because responding to ableism, to disability prejudice, is everyone's responsibility. Thank you very much.